My name is Mark Polk and this is my RV garage. I got bit by the RV bug when I was 15 years old and still have it today. I started in this industry washing campers and since that time I've helped educate over a quarter million RVers on how to safely and properly use and maintain their RV. My favorite pastimes are RVs, muscle cars, and motorcycles. Welcome to my RV garage. I just got back from another trip to the home improvement store. I'm anticipating getting started with the decking on the roof and starting to put some interior panels back inside the old Yellowstone. When it comes to interior paneling for an RV, there's lots of choices, but I wanted to stick with that vintage natural wood look. So what I did was I purchased some 4x8 hardwood paneling that I'm going to stain with the stain that's got a polyurethane in, in with the stain. It's going to be a lot of extra work, but I think it's going to be well worth it in the end. Maybe I can get Tyler to help me with it. All right, let's get this wood inside. Grab that. Set it down without dropping it. Hey, Don. Yeah? Tyler can't go with me today to work on a trailer. You think you can help me? Sure, I can go help you. Just give me a few minutes. All right. I sure hope I can do what he needs me to do. This episode of Mark's RV Garage is sponsored in part by Camping World, KOA, Progressive Dynamics, and Explorer RV Insurance. Please take a minute to visit our sponsors when you have a chance. Happy RV learning. Now I want to run our 12 volt wiring. 12 volt wiring needs to be run for devices like the water pump, fan motors, overhead lights, the refrigerator, stereo, LP gas leak detector, and anything else you put in the RV that runs on 12 volts. After we run the wiring, we want to label it like we did the 120 volt wiring, so when it's time to connect it to our power center, we won't be scratching our head. If there's any problems, I'll just blame it on Tyler.
Now that we've got our wiring roughed in, this is a great time to rough in some of the plumbing. I went to my local hardware store and picked up some PEX plumbing supplies, and the plan today is to run some hot and cold water lines throughout the trailer. I'm not going to install any fittings today until I get some of the components in and I know exactly where I have to route some of the additional water lines. I did the same thing I did with the electrical with the plumbing. I drew a simple diagram to give me some idea of exactly where I expect some of these components for the plumbing system to be located. What I'm going to do now is cut some metal strapping and then put it over any of the wood in the trailer where we have a uh, plumbing line or wiring running through the wood. So when we're putting our interior paneling on, there's no chance that I can uh, accidentally put a screw through a plumbing line or the wiring. not quite sure what to think about this A-frame coupler. Uh, as I was grinding it to get it ready to, to primer and paint, I noticed it almost looks like somebody replaced it at one time. And I also noticed that the coupler doesn't, the locking mechanism on the coupler doesn't work very well. So I'm going to do a little bit of research and we may have to actually cut this uh, A-frame section out and replace it with a new one. Have you ever heard the term rat rod before? A rat rod was a less expensive version of a hot rod. You wanted a hot rod but really couldn't afford to build one so you used what you had available and made your own. Rat rods were built to drive, not to show, and oftentimes you would use parts from different types of cars to build your rat rod. In the end, it kind of showed some of the owner's personality in the final product. The old Yellowstone is a travel trailer version of a rat rod. We're using what we have available and throwing it all together to make it work, and it's being built to use, not to show. We want to live up to Yellowstone's old slogan, good on the go and great when you get there.
got this really nice piece of ceiling fabric from that friend of mine who was retiring from an RV dealership. And I was excited to use it on the ceiling of the old Yellowstone, but when I took it out and measured it, I realized there wasn't enough to do the entire ceiling. I hate to see it go to waste, so what I think I'm going to do is cut it into a couple sections and put, put it on each end of the ceiling, uh, just to give it a, a nice look and, and not to let it go to waste. I've got the fabric cut for this back section, this curved piece. First thing I'm going to do is put a few staples in it to help hold it in place. And then I'm going to use a spray adhesive to actually put it on. I ended up getting quarter inch decking for the roof because of weight concerns. With a single axle trailer, you need to be more concerned about weight than with a tandem axle trailer. You only have two tires supporting the weight of the trailer as opposed to four. Quarter inch roof decking will work, I just need to be extra careful when I'm up there working on the roof. When, when the old Yellowstone trailer was manufactured, uh, Everything was nails. There wasn't one screw in the trailer. Everything was nailed together. So basically what I'm trying to do now is just put a few screws in just to give it a little extra reinforcement. Hold up a little better. I'm getting the roof ready to put the decking on, the roof decking, and what I'm doing right now is I'm measuring in everywhere that I have wire running through the roof rafters. I'm just making a note that I have wires at 33 inches and 36 inches in, so when I screw the decking down on the rafters, I won't put a screw through any of the wiring. So it's a little time consuming, but well worth the effort. All right, the next step before we put our decking on is insulate the roof. Sure we hit our rafters and we'll measure in and mark it so we don't hit our wires. Be sure to tune in to the next episode of Mark's RV Garage when Mark and Tyler work on the holding tanks and start putting the old Yellowstone back together again. 
One of the most enjoyable times of an RV trip is when you're sitting outside on a beautiful evening. Whether it's enjoying a campfire, the company, or the sound surrounding you at night, it's just a lot of fun. Nothing adds to that ambiance more than a nice set of patio lights for your awning. These lights come in all shapes and sizes to suit your personal preference. Let's install a set right now and show you just how easy it is to enjoy the evening in your outside patio. The first step is to remove all the components from the box. We have our string light set a globe and shade for each light, and a chrome plated hook for each light. Now we can install the hooks into the top of each light assembly and install our light bulbs. The bulbs are not included and they need to be rated at 60 watts or less. The last step is to add our shades and screw the globes into each of the lamp holders. To hang the globes from our awning roller tube we're going to use these awning hooks. Just slip the hooks into the same track the awning strap slides in and hang the patio lights. It's that easy to install your patio light set and you can use the awning hooks to hang all sorts of things. I even use them to hang my plants. The shaded globe string light set and the awning hooks are both available at www.campingworld.com. Happy camping! Now Marty, Patty informed me that you have some great tips for new RVers after your rookie season as an RVer. Would you like to share some of those tips with our viewers? We certainly learned a few, uh, few uh, tidbits during our, our first year. Um, it's always good to unplug the electrical cord before you pull out of the uh, campsite. Well, that's a that, good tip. That, that was one. <laughs> uh, we had a situation where I was backing the trailer into our drive, which is kind of hard. We're on a busy street, 90 degree angle. And every time, Patty, you got a tree, you got this, you got that. And I was just getting more frustrated, more frustrated. And it was getting dark. It was kind of nighttime. And I couldn't see anything she was talking about. She finally walks over to the truck and says, hey, stupid, take <laughs> off the sunglasses. It's nighttime. <laughs> so how and when did you get into RVing? Well, Patty's got some health issues. Uh, about six years ago, she was diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis with MS. And traveling got very hard. You got to take certain food. She's on a restricted diet, needles, you know, for injections. And going through security at an airport, sometimes they were very gracious. Other times it was just very tough. Oh, I can imagine. And, you know, when there would be a scare or something, they'd ramp up security and it would be very hard. Airplanes are often not on time, even though they tell you they are. And when you have long delays and you have issues with food, and, and uh, uh, there's mm. a sort of a neurologic fatigue that kicks in uh, with a number of these chronic illnesses, and it's, it's very tough. And it's not like, gee, you were up last night and tired. People describe it like, uh, Patty describes it like, you know, you're drowning in quicksand. And mm. when it kicks in, you just really can't function. So if you have an RV, you pull over, you got a bed. If you need a special meal and you can't find food, you can make your food. You need to refrigerate medicine, you got your refrigerator with you. Exactly. And it is also a peace of mind to know you have your home pod with you, the mothership with whatever you need. And we were coming back from a uh, weekend away, which should have been a lovely weekend, and it was, but it was just really tough because of all the issues. And out of the blue, to this day, I have no idea where the thought came from. Um, I looked at her and said, why don't we just get an RV? For all hmm. the reasons I just said. Well, Marty, tell me a little bit about uh, the charity RV for the cause and, and what that's all about and what you do with that. We, we you know, when we, we got the RV, we decided we would do it because it made it easier for Patty to travel, and we wanted to do it. And um, it just seemed too easy just to travel and enjoy it, which we are. It's, it's, we're having a blast. Even Elvis loves it. And what could we do to make it something more substantive and more meaningful? And I've done a lot of lecturing over the years for different professional groups and consumer groups on estate planning, which is what I do. And I said, why don't we use this as an opportunity to lecture around the country on planning for chronic illness? When Patty was first diagnosed, um, after we dealt with all the personal and medical issues, I decided, you know, I have to do some of the planning that I advise people and clients about. And I was absolutely shocked that there was literally almost nothing published in the professional literature on how to deal with chronic illness and health issues. Other than maybe Medicaid planning and special needs trusts, there's nothing. Wow. And I thought that was just 
t terribly wrong. And over the past five, six years, I've I set about trying to correct that situation. I've written 20, 30 articles about different aspects of planning for chronic illness and health issues. Uh, it turned into three different books. One you have here that I wrote for the uh, Michael J. Fox yeah. Foundation on charitable fundraising for Parkinson's. I did one for the National MS Society, and I did a um, consumer book on estate planning for people with chronic illness and disability. And they're all published by Demos uh, Medical Publishing, D-E-M-O-S Medical Publishing. And all the proceeds go to charity. We don't make anything on it. And I wanted to try to address that problem because it's wrong that if someone has a health issue, they can't get the information they need to protect themselves and their loved ones. Well, that's great. That, that's just great to hear. And, and where can people go to get more information on your books and more information on RV for the cause? Well, for consumers, the main book would be the um, uh, Estate Planning for Chronic Illness, which is available for, from Demos Medical Publishing. And you can just Google it. Uh, it's probably on Amazon as well. Uh, this website that we set up, it's RV4, the number 4, the cause, T H E C A U S E dot org. And we have a wealth of material and we add to it all the time. Now, Patty, we have three dogs and they love to travel in the RV. What role does Elvis play in the program? Oh, my God. Um, I don't want to take away anything from all of Marty's hard work and effort, which goes into every seminar and every webinar we do. But. Elvis is really the star of the show. The star, <laughs> right? Now I know where I rate. Uh, we, we, we can't go anywhere without people asking us about Elvis because he's just an amazing, he's an amazing dog. He's a, um, a registered therapy dog. Oh, so wow. So he's used to being in places and um, just being very obedient. And again, not to take anything away from Marty, but he usually sleeps during Marty's lectures, gets his downtime. <laughs> yeah. um, but Makes when me feel we're good. Done, when we're done, um, all the folks in the who've attended come to us and ask questions about Elvis. Yeah, not me, and, uh, just Elvis. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, if, he, if it's really special, some of the waity, waiters that uh, work in these facilities are very kind to him and give him some special treats. Oh which boy! Is very appreciative. Yes. Uh, but, he, no, he's part, he's part of the team. The star of the show. Yeah. <laughs> Marty, what suggestions can you make to those living with chronic illness and their loved ones? Um, the real most important issues are your health, taking care of your health, dealing with medical insurance and things like that. But that's not really my expertise. I mean, um, we try to share some of the things we've done, you know, some of the healthy lifestyle choices that we've made to help Patty. Um, the area that I have more expertise in and what we've focused our program on is trying to help people with the estate planning, legal planning, financial tax, and all those related issues. And I think that the most important thing is to be vocal and clear and admit what you have going on and communicate it. That's really the key word because if you don't communicate what your experience is of your health issue, no one's going to understand it. And even though it would be nice if people were more sensitive or more understanding, the unfortunate reality is that everybody's got their plate full with whatever they're involved with. So if you take the time, if you're working with an accountant, an attorney, if you have a business partner, share with them what's going on and try to make sure they can really help you back. I think too many people don't do that. You have to be very proactive. Oftentimes there's simple things you can do like changing uh, something under an insurance policy you have or changing your investment program. That's some great advice, Marty, and uh, I think it's like with Don and I, it's kind of like a wake-up call. It's, it's issues that you really don't want to be confronted with or don't want to deal with, but it's things that you really do need to address. And I think somebody that's you know, letting other people know that, hey, this is some things that you need to be concerned with and, and it's all right to talk about this stuff uh, is just a great thing. You, you may not hear it every day, but I think there's a lot of grateful people that uh, are appreciative to what you know for what you're doing and the service that you're providing. And you may not hear that often enough, but uh, uh, I think it's just wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Well, Marty and Patty, um, thanks so much for stopping by. It was great to meet you in person. And um, again, uh, keep up the good work with what you're doing. And I. Just for one more time, tell the viewers where they can get more information on RV for the Cause. The, the website is, is www.rv, the number four, the cause, T H E C A U S E dot org, RV for the Cause dot org. And we have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash RV for the Cause.
I want to thank you for all that you've done. It's been a great help, and I think uh, the publicity you're giving to what we're doing will help a lot of people. So we, we want to thank you. And we're going to do it a little formally. Wow. So we have a plaque that we had made oh, for you and Dawn. That's beautiful. And I'll read it. It says, RV for the cause, helping those living with chronic illness, which is our, our objective. It says, with thanks to Mark and Dawn Polk, RV Education 101, Harrells, North Carolina, March 29th, 2011, for your generosity and support in helping raise awareness about chronic illness and disability. Wow. That's absolutely beautiful. So we thank appreciate you. what you've done. Patty, thank you thank so you. much. And Elvis says thank you, too. Well, Dawn says thank you. She's operating a camera right now, but she is thrilled to death as well. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> <laughs>
Mark's RV Garage is a show designed to help you learn how to use and maintain your RV. But there's more to RVing than the RV itself. We want to offer you technical information on your RV, but we also want to provide relevant information on the entire scope of RVing. A big part of enjoying the RV experience is family and food. Cooking in your RV kitchen is different than cooking at home, and there's another internet show to help you in your RV kitchen. It's called the RV Cooking Show with host Ivan Schmarter. The RV Cooking Show, part RV travel guide and part cooking class on wheels, shows information about not-to-be-missed RV destinations, and it shows RVers how to create fantastic destination-related dishes in their own RV kitchens. For more information on the RV Cooking Show, visit www.rvcookingshow.com. If you missed previous episodes of Mark's RV Garage, just go to www.rvconsumer.com and get caught up. Until then, travel safe, have fun in your RV, and remember, when it comes to learning about your RV, we've got you covered.